Boy, is there a lot to talk about. And you've been talking about it, and we've got a lot to tell you, and we're excited about the things we're telling you. This is certainly an important time of transition. Um, but before I start in on all that, I do want to ask Steve Hart, who's a graduate of the uh, MSOD program, 2002, uh, works at the Federal Reserve, uh, does work with them in talent development and leadership, and uh, he's probably out in the other room right now. Oh, here he is. <laughs> I'm looking over your head, Steve. Please, come on up. Please uh, join me in extending a Thank you very much. I, this is a great honor for me to host you here today. I'm delighted to have you in our building. We're about to celebrate our 100th year as an organization, so this is a wonderful time for the Federal Reserve System as a whole. This building was actually built in 1976. The prior building was a 10th and Chestnut, built in 1914. So we're about uh, entering into this 100th year. And my work here is, uh, I, I was telling Alan earlier, the, the master's degree from Penn and the EOD program was uh, an amazing opportunity for me to transition what was then a marketing and strategy career into a human development career. And I've been involved now for the last 10 years using that knowledge I gained from our program uh, in a very practical way, leading transition change and leadership development here at the bank. It's been a great path to be on, uh, wonderful people to work with, a great organization, tremendously supportive management in the organization. So I feel like I uh, sort of died and gone to heaven working in this field and being here, and certainly the work and the, the opportunity I had at Penn has, has informed that practice tremendously. So great staff here, and we're wonderful, great to share with you our building and facilities for this event today. I know it's, there's a lot of transition and change going on in the program, so I'm anxious to hear what they're all about too. So again, my welcome to you. At the back of the room, I put a book up there called Who We Are and What We Do. Uh, you're welcome to take that with you. There's a few small books on the Federal Open Market Committee. I don't have enough of them to go around for everybody. You're welcome to take whatever is there. Thank you for holding them up at the back there. <laughs> there they are. And uh, again, welcome. Great to have you here. I'll let you get on with the program. myself to turn my cell phone off. We don't want interruptions here. Um, so if you would as well, that's great. Um, many of you were is busy reconnecting and talking. There is a wonderful exhibit out there, and it's exclusively ours for a while. So after this, uh, these presentations and questions, if you get a chance, uh, view the exhibit. They give free money samples away in there. <laughs> need a lot of glue to put it back together. It's shredded, but, uh, but it's well worth seeing. And, uh, and again, Steve, thanks so much. Um, other announcements. Uh, there's a number of things that, before we really get to the heart of our agenda today, um, we have a program council. Uh, there's a few people from the program council here. I know I saw Paul Welford. Paul, are you there? Yeah. You want to step up and say a few words? Uh, the Program Council is a group within our current student population that are trying to make a strong connection to make sure that the program staff and, and our program is well connected to the current students, finding out what they need, uh, opening up the communication links. As you well know, many of our participants are part-time students. They're here for one course. Um, and so trying to create a community from people who are, don't have a a local residence and a, a space to be uh, all together. We do it today, um, but there are times when we like to do that on an ongoing basis. And uh, Paul Welfer and Chris, Christina DeLucia, Christine O'Neill, and Michael Light are a group that are helping us do that. Paul? Well, I think Alan just said it all, but um, <laughs> Yeah, we serve as, as hopefully student representatives to uh, promoting and developing the, the uh, Dynamics community. And, and for me, a big part of that is, is getting student feedback, um, communicating out to the community what events and activities, um, community building and social are, are going on and planned, as well as 
bringing back in feedback from um, all of the membership of the community writ large. To that end, um, we do have a website. I don't know. Did you? No. Oh. Well, we do have a website if you search for us on, on, on the Dynamics link. Um, as well, we have a listserv to um, communicate to us any feedback you may have. Um, we meet roughly monthly, uh, and in particular, we are uh, assisting in the management of the Dining Dollars program, as well as various social networking events. There, there are <clears throat> a couple, three or four upcoming activities that you've hopefully heard about or will hear about. One is we'll be conducting a, a student survey in the fall. Um, as well, this semester we, we're initiating um, a class or a course reps program, so that basically, if you haven't heard about it yet, we're asking that um, in each course, uh, students self-select one representative that can serve as an auxiliary uh, council for, again, communication and feedback. We have uh, planning probably in mid-October um, a Terror Behind the Walls event, so basically an outing to the Eastern State Pen. Um, we promise to let you out of jail at the end of the evening. Um, and then most recently, coming up on October 4th, we, uh, we do interact quite a bit with both SASCOV and GAPSA, the larger university uh, student governance uh, agencies, I guess. And so on October 4th, Friday, there will be a, a happy hour at City Tap House on campus for anyone who's interested. Again, um, I'll be here through the day. Uh, Chris, Chris, and Mike, I don't think could make it, but uh, we're, we're all around campus. You have our emails, or you can look them up, and feel free to reach out to us. Thanks. I think you're sensing right now is that yes, we're always been trying to be a community and connect ourselves. Uh, we're, we're trying to connect more to uh, the university, to the School of Arts and Sciences, to this uh, School of Arts and Sciences uh, student organizations, to uh, certainly the other organizations within the school and the university. Um, because there's a lot of common ground and a lot of things to share. We're finding more and more students from other programs in our courses, faculty members, you'll know that. Um, and uh, this, is, this is an opportunity for us all to sort of increase the, the conversation across those boundaries and borders of our program to other programs. Um, one thing that's happening, and I'll give you uh, some more about this, is that we are increasing the numbers of international students in our program. People are here from other countries for a period of two, three years uh, to do a full-time degree in one of our programs. Um, and I must single out a few people who have really helped us um, make those connections to help us connect those people and those students to each other. For example, this Friday at lunch, we will have an international student lunch uh, for the continuing and new students. Uh, and some of that's just exchange of information. How do you, how do you buy books? Uh, where, or where, yes, we know you go to the bookstore, but what else can you do? And, and how do you know about courses? And orientation and getting our feet on the ground. Uh, so, Anna Olavos, you're here. Put your stand up, please. <laughs> Anna's been a, Anna's from Chile. <laughs> Anna has her younger sister with her today. <laughs> uh, but Anna's been a very big help to help us reach out and make these connections, uh, and we appreciate that. And there's many others who are helping her too. John Kim from uh, Korea and, and many others, Amr El Buckley from Egypt, uh, and many others. So it's an active community, it's growing, and we're really excited to have you as part of our community. Thank you. Um, the other thing I'll say is there's, even this morning, a transitions city. Boy, transitions, I should have been in that group because there's lots of transitions going on. But this is a special interest group, a SIG, within ODIN, our Organizational Dynamics Exchange Network, of our alumni, our graduates, who are transitioning, some to retirement and some from one career to another, and uh, <coughs> evidently there's even other possibilities within those transition uh, groups. So that's a group that's beginning to meet and form, and we'll let you know more about that. I will uh, just uh, ask Paul Wallman to stand up, Paul, excuse me, excuse me, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Wallman, Bruce Wallman's an IBMer and uh, graduated in 92, I believe, 
Well, let's think about this. Last time I graduated was 95. It's, ah, thank you. Is it on? Yes. <laughs> All right. I graduated in 95. Uh, it's Bruce Wallman. And if you want to contact me in terms of email for the transitions group, it's B-R-U-C-E-W-A-L-L-M-A-N at gmail.com. I no longer use my IBM email for outside stuff because I am transitioning out by the end of this year. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Bruce. So you'll get more, hear more about that. Um, I would like, before uh, I begin my comments, to introduce two people to you here in the front row. Vice Dean Nora Lewis of the Professional Liberal Education uh, Division of the School of Arts and Sciences. We'll hear from uh, Nora Lewis um, after my comments. And also Executive Director of the LPS, the Liberal Professional Studies Program, Dave Bieber, is here today. These are our partners uh, in terms of organization dynamics within PLE and the School of Arts and Sciences, uh, the professional master's degree programs. So let me get on with it. Um, there's a lot going on and a lot has happened in, since uh, mid-August in terms of our program. Uh, the things I want to talk today are really about this transition and about the renewal of our program, <coughs> the continuing strengths of it and why we're administratively changing the program. Uh, we're coming in, if I will, if I can use a, the meta analogy, into a tighter, closer orbit within School of Arts and Sciences, joining other <coughs> master's degree programs and professionals um, in the uh, PLE, the Professional Liberal Education. Why is that? Um, well, I want to talk to you about the value of this program and the assets we have and why those are important, as we know, to our, ourselves and our community, but why they are important to the School of Arts and Sciences and why they are important to the University of Pennsylvania. Our program, um, or Masters of Science and Masters of Philosophy and Organizational Dynamics, we're not 100 years old uh, like the Federal Reserve, but we're clo close to 37 now. We are, I believe, it's fair to say, the growth market, the emerging growth market for the University of Pennsylvania. Programs like ours, and certainly our program, that attracts mid-career professionals uh, to the university. Um, the undergraduate programs, very strong, uh, are certainly experiencing the ongoing and escalating of tuition costs. Um, and plus, that demographic in the US population is decreasing. So there'll be more and more competition for undergraduates uh, to fill uh, college uh, BA and BS programs. The pen is very strong. It's not in any uh, threats there. Of, but there will be many colleges, small colleges uh, around the United States that will be quite struggling in the coming years to, to continue their programs. So Penn doesn't have that problem. But they're, to keep their program strong, they're, they're in need of all the tuition they raise, but also the, the surplus that we raise, the, the dollars that we spend and can help the undergraduate programs thrive. PhD education, doctoral, uh, doctoral education in all the various departments of the School of Arts and Sciences, also a very expensive proposition, and, and a number of uh, slots for candidates, PhD candidates, that is diminishing. And yet, we also are generating revenues and surpluses that help them do their programs. <coughs> Unto ourselves, we are a, a, an important degree program. There are two ways, I think, to look at what's going on with programs like organizational dynamics. One is, yes, we're putting handles on the university for professional degree students who are 30 to 55 or 60 years old to tap in, to take a hold of, to benefit from the, the talent and the ideas and the theory and concepts and all that are here at the university, the thinking, the knowledge. But we are also, in the other view of that same perspective, as we like to flip our frames, the portal, the, the doorway through which people in this greater Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey community to New York, to Washington, 
walk through to become and benefit from this university. Our program and its culture and its community is a very important asset to the university. We know that we all learn from each other in our seminars, um, that it's, a, it's the conversation that we have in those seminars, and it's not just a simple transfer of the knowledge from the, the professors to the students, it's a conversation and an exchange. Two of the assets we have are certainly constantly being renewed, and we're certainly in a position of needing to renew them. Uh, the first, I would say, is the standing faculty. We've had many of the University of Pennsylvania standing faculty in our courses and in our programs. Uh, Walter Licht is still active in the program and a very important ally to us. But we have recently lost Henry Tooney, uh, a standing faculty member that many of you probably knew and took his courses. He's no longer with us and we miss that. Uh, and there have been many others. And it is a time for us to really focus on who are the new standing faculty, who are the standing faculty that we can bring into our program to create access for our students um, so that they can benefit from their knowledge and research and insights. So that's a big step and a challenge for us. But the good news is we will have the help of, of LPS, our sister programs, the PLE, the Professional Minimal Education Program, in doing that. It won't be just the personal connections that we can make, but it will be these institutional connections that we will help them do what they uh, are trying to do, and they will help us. So new standing faculty will be active in the program. That's something that's high on my list, and certainly <coughs> Vice Dean Nora Lewis. So that's an important asset. But as I say, it's not just the exchange of professors to students. We have affiliated faculty. That is an extremely important asset, as you well know in our program. The people who are not tenured faculty at the university, but the people who have academic credentials and know how this con these concepts and principles are applied and practiced in organizations, in businesses, in government, in school systems, in healthcare systems, in all the various industries in this area, the pharma, the financial services industries. That ability to translate, if you will, concepts and principles into practice. Many of the faculty in this room are exactly that type of professor and that type of instructor. And their courses are sought out and they're valuable. That's an asset that we need to continue to renew and stay current with. There are new courses and new topics that need to be brought in. So renewed standing faculty connections, renewed affiliated faculty connections. And of course, you know that those need to be renewed because there as well, we lose faculty members. Uh, Jim Larkin, a, a wonderful faculty member who's taught for years at the Graduate School of Education, taught for many years with us, is no longer with us. We were hoping he would teach this summer. Suddenly he was unable to, and he's already uh, passed, um, passed along. So his son is in our program, Colin. Uh, I know his wife, Marie, she's the school nurse where my children went to school at GFS. Um, this is a, a blow to all of them, but it's a blow to us uh, in his wonderful courses and his work. So Jim Larkin is no longer with us, but we need to find more Jim Larkins, more affiliated faculty, more people that can come in and connect with our, our students. Um, part of this transition as we move from organizational dynamics is, I would say, yeah, a bit of an outlier program, a program that was certainly always a part of the university, but we had great degrees of freedom to try new things and be creative. And um, we're coming into a tighter orbit, a closer orbit, because we are important to the university, as I've said. So with that come some challenges. We must keep our brand, we must keep our culture, our community. And it's the, as we come into the center, we want to make sure we bring that with us. And that other programs will benefit from that, from our sense of, of, uh, yes, you're here as a student, but you're also here as a member of our community um, and a lifelong learner. Uh, that's a very important thing to us. We'll bring that in. I know that the School of Arts and Sciences and the uh, Professional Liberal Education School wants that. Wants to, we want to infuse the other programs with that kind of spirit and sense of membership and citizenship that we have. So look for more of that, not less. Um, so that's important as we come in. now. It does mean that 
we're on a transition where we are our one, we have partners, we have sister programs. I'm working closely with Dave Bieber uh, with the other Master City programs. And Dave, as the executive director of LPS, has been a real ally for us in terms of coming in and working together. And our conversations are questions back and forth, not telling each other what to do, but, but talking about things and solving problems together. That's collaboration. That's what we teach in our courses. That's what we're trying to do as we come in here. So there's opportunity for influence and exchange. And that's what we're all about. And that's what we will be doing as we move forward. Um, we will, many of our staff, uh, Gwen, who's here, and Elaine, and Rashida, uh, Chris, Angelucci, these are all important staff to us, part of our community. I think as staff members, I must say, that I think we are particularly lucky because we see the progression of the participants and the students over three or four or five years from their first courses to by the time they're graduating. And what a transition that is. Uh, the sense of growth and development and the spirit that, and the, con the connections between people. This is very exciting for us. Part-time students themselves don't see that so much. They have their own network or their own small group. But we get to see it uh, on a daily basis. And quite honestly, the staff's been a very important asset to building that, uh, that community and that culture. So hats off to, to all of you. Uh, and they're here today helping us meet as a, as a community. Here. Um, so as we transition, some of these staff positions move to a, a central shared services group. This is a group. Uh, that will continue to do what they do for us, but also for the other programs. Uh, when it comes to enrollment, when it comes to registration for courses, we will not, we'll no longer have our own sort of custom system. We'll use the mainframe systems of the university for registering for courses and, uh, and enrollment. And we're certainly already using the online application. So we're upgrading and streamlining and mainstreaming our processes. But you know, they will stay a continued part of our, our community uh, serving us, but also serving other programs. Uh, I need to let you all know that, that Gwen Hughes has decided to uh, stand up a second there, Gwen. for 16 years, not all with organizational dynamics, but certainly the last many. And uh, she's decided to retire. To, to, uh, she's got other, other responsibilities in her life, and this transition point is a good time for her to, uh, to take retirement. We will miss you. You've been a very strong team member, a team player for us, and we will miss you. Rashida and I stay in organizational dynamics, and we're presently looking for a, uh, a director of uh, administration, an administrative director of the program. Uh, Chris and Elaine will be in this shared essential services pool, uh, doing what they do so well, not only for us, but for the other programs within LDS. So, in terms of renewal, some of the things I want to point out, there are transitions, and they are difficult. Larry Starr led this program for 11 years, and has spent 11 years at the helm of this organization. I was teaching here that whole time. I came in 2006 to help him with academic um, and collaboration, uh, curriculum development, and, uh, academic issues. Um, but he's He's done a lot for us, and he's transitioning out. I think you've seen his letter recently. Uh, he's wishing us well, and we certainly wish Larry Starr well in his activities and endeavors. Uh, it's in everyone's interest that the students he's advising uh, are not disrupted as they get through their capstones and trying to uh, complete courses that they haven't done. So within the next year, Larry is, is working closely with those students, will work with those students on their capstones completing any courses um, so that their program and their progress is not disrupted. That's very generous of him and we're very glad to have him helping out. He's, he's oriented toward helping his learners and uh, we're glad to see that and we're glad to, that that can continue. 
But this transition and coming in does mean some different uh, patterns and behavior, some different situations and conditions. Uh, and Larry uh, is, is no longer going to be the director of the program <coughs> and not teaching in the program. Um, we will learn from what Larry did and we will try to take those things that he started and continue them and, and help them develop. But that's true with all of our courses and our ability to connect what people need out there in organizations and what we provide in sort of the classroom. The, I mentioned the assets of the standing faculty and the affiliated faculty. But let me be very clear that we understand one of our greatest values and assets that we bring to the university and our own program is you, the participants in the program, the members of the community. Extremely important aspect because, it, as I said, it's not transfer of knowledge and expertise from a faculty member to a student. It's a productive conversation. It's an exchange of information, an exchange of perspectives about theory and concepts and practice and what works. And you are those people that bring that to those seminar classrooms, to that space, the things you deal with in your organizations. So when we put those things together in a room, faculty, instructor, uh, the participants from all of these different organizations, sparks begin to fly and exciting things begin to happen. And quite honestly, we've always said it's hard to tell the, the learners, uh, the students from the professors because everyone's engaged in that conversation and everyone's learning from it. Uh, so that's an asset we need to continue to do and develop and bring more people into this. I've heard people say, you know, we're one of the best kept secrets, uh, not just at the university, of, but in academics of this type of program. I believe that. We don't want to be a best kept secret. We want more people to know about this. We want to know how we can offer our seminars and be more available and cast our net wider to bring in more students from even farther away. Some of that will mean internet and hybrid activities in our courses, doing some things online and in virtual space um, so that we can do that uh, and reach other people. It might be courses that are clustered around the way we do the cohort and OCEC, uh, Organizational Consulting and Executive Coaching, uh, in, in spurts or in clusters of activity as opposed to one class a week for 14 weeks. So these are all things we'll be looking at and learning and experimenting with and, and developing new ways. But the important thing is that we have students and participants in these, in these programs. Here is some of the artwork, and one, one of, I think we're benefiting already from the fact that we have students, uh, an increasing number of new admits in our program, and uh, hopefully going to see more of those students active in their course uh, taking as opposed to taking one and then inactive for a semester. This economy has been rough for all of us, and certainly for our program where people slow down the number of courses they're taking and space it out based on tuition reimbursement programs and other things. But as part of PLE and the School of Arts and Sciences, we have marketing resources and skills and uh, competencies that we didn't really have before. At Market East, right now, some of you have seen this, there's a whole series of um, transit ad campaigns that feature our program, and it has been an award-winning program. These banners, you see the settings here, uh, but let me get back up here to actually see some of these Penn Masters of Science and Organizational Dynamics. Some of you have seen these. Um, this is attracting people, and on and, uh, HYY, on the radio spots, people are coming in saying, I heard about this on the radio. I want to know more about it. They're coming to our information sessions and walk-in Wednesdays. So these are promotions that we haven't had in recent years, and they're helping us. Um, <laughs> so the marketing is bringing new people in. I wanted to show you some statistics here if I can. I think I can do this. I hope I can find, yep, excuse me. Okay, admissions. That was 2012. A lot of people in the spring as tuition reimbursement uh, policies and companies hits. 
some fewer people taking summer courses, but uh, some new students starting. This is just not regist course registrations. These are new admits. And then in the fall, 16 students. We started off the spring of 2013 with a few down from uh, the spring of 2012. But look what happened in summer. And look what happened in the fall. Wow. This is our lifeblood, and this is important, and this is uh, exciting. We had an information, we had a new student orientation at, uh, in our classroom C over at 3440, and people barely fit in the room. We had some 50 people, uh, the 44 plus 20 of the summer, that's 64, some 50 plus people were in that room that night, and it's exciting, and it's a wonderful uh, opportunity and, and pulse for us. And we need to continue to build on this. This is just beginning to turn the, the corner from where we've been the last number of years. And we need to keep that ramping up. So the marketing department will do theirs. The faculty and the staff will do theirs. And we ask you to do your part, which is to let people know about this program. Tell people about it. Um, it send them to us. Give them our emails. Give them our phone numbers. And we'll be glad to uh, invite them and, and tell them more about it. Um, we oftentimes talk to them, I do, and the staff, but we like to put them in contact with graduates and with students, current students, and others in the program so that they really get multiple perspectives about what this program's about. And they, they hear it from students like themselves. It's a very uh, effective marketing, uh, network marketing campaign that we really have, and we want that to continue. So we ask you to, to help us in that regard. So going forward, um, there's lots of things that we will expect to do, lots of changes, um, but a lot, along with the change and renewal, we want to continue to keep what is truly ours, which is our culture and our sort of sense of community. Um, we want people, one of the things that I, that uh, all of you had to do a capstone, some of you are in the process of doing a capstone, some of you will do a capstone, um, we are going to probably redesign that curriculum a bit to make sure that it's front end loaded some of the writing and research skills that you need to get through a capstone, but get, give it to you early in your program so that you can use it in all your courses. We have voluntary workshops that Jen Greco does and that uh, Steve Freeman do. Uh, yeah, they're voluntary and some people take advantage of them. Many people want to take advantage of them, but they don't have the time. Uh, Many years ago, we had a writing uh, task force, and I'm looking at Janet and Jay, and uh, we talked about ways to improve this. Uh, all of us, all of us, we're, we're only going to become better writers by paying attention to our writing. Some of us absolutely need it, and some of us can need it to just get better, be more effective communicators. We want to build that into the curriculum early in the program, so everybody takes it. It's not voluntary, it's part of the core, the capstone curriculum. We expect that to happen, but these are not decisions I'm going to make uh, just in consultation of what I think is best. We have a faculty advisory group uh, with Famita Handy and Walter Licht and Jean-Marc Choucron, and who am I forgetting? Me. And Jen Greco, of course. <laughs> and Nora Lewis and myself um, and others who we may expand that. We need to renew that. We need to keep that vital. But that's sort of our advisory committee that, that we bounce ideas around and figure out what to do and how to go forward. So there will be some changes uh, in that. We want to continue to do the things we've done, but we do need to make sure that there is a, a central, strong core to the curriculum and the program, as well as your ability to design your own program, to do the things. You're all coming to us from different places. And we want you to have that aspect of customizing and, and uh, finding the right courses for, for you in terms of your pathway and your trajectory. Steve started us off with this idea of a launch pad. The capstone is a hoop that you jump through for the pen degree, which is a wonderful asset to all of you. Um, and it's one of the things you come to pen for, the pen degree. But to use that capstone and use your curriculum and the courses you take, to not just get the degree, but to launch you, to, to be the, uh, the, the stage to do something new, uh, 
is, is an exception. We've seen it time and time again, and we'd like to have that happen. We want you to do those things. It's good for you, and it's certainly wonderful for us to see you succeeding in those ways. In addition to all the changes you see happening and that we begin to talk about within the program, within organizational dynamics, at least you think that it is only organizational dynamics that's changing. I want to now really invite uh, Nora Lewis up, Vice Dean Nora Lewis, to tell you about the changes in the School of Arts and Sciences, the strategic planning, and all the things that are changing that we are a part of. And at the end, we'll take questions, but I'd like you to hold your questions for now until after Nora gives <coughs> her presentation. Click outside of it and then click back into it. There you go. Thank you, Alan. Let's see. Have I got the microphone where it's working? Great. Well, I have to say first that I'm just delighted to be here today. I think this is my third Dynamics Brunch, and it is truly an amazing and wonderful experience to be able to talk to people who uh, were in the program in the 1980s and took courses with Russ Apoff through to students who are taking their first courses this semester. It, it's truly an amazing and enduring community. Um, I've talked with any number of faculty. I think I've been at Penn a long time at 25 years, but a lot of the faculty of Dynamics have been here longer and engaged with the program, and I think that's one of the the strengths is the, is the resilience, the flexible, enduring nature of the community, how it adjusts to the changing environment to keep itself relevant. And as Alan was saying, that's really the process that we're going through now. Um, and as he referenced, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about um, our larger containing system. That's something Larry, or the phrase that Larry always gave me, uh, the containing system for dynamics in terms of uh, changes and uh, uh, possible events happening at the school level, at the university level. And because as a community you're a tremendous resource, I want to pick your brains a little bit um, as part of, of what we do this morning. So to start off with, um, many of you may know that Penn just completed a very successful campaign for Penn fundraising. And so Penn President Amy Gutman is now engaged in the next uh, era of envisioning the future and the goals for the university. And she's referring to this as, as Penn Compact 2020, her vision for Penn over the next decade. Um, I know it may be a little hard to read the slide, but I wanted to just begin with her quote. This is on the Penn website. Penn Compact 2020 builds on the past decade of progress we've made in advancing the University of Pennsylvania. It's a far-reaching vision that outlines next steps to increase access to Penn's exceptional resources, integrate knowledge across academic disciplines with emphasis on innovative understanding and discovery, and engage locally, nationally, and globally to bring the benefits of Penn's research, teaching, and service to individuals and communities at home and around the world. I think that really sets the stage for everything that we want to do in arts and sciences and also in dynamics. So again, I know many of you know this, but for those who, who may not be following everything that happens at Penn every day, the School of Arts and Sciences has a new dean, Steve Fluharty. Um, Steve is a cognitive neuroscientist by training. He is a very eminent researcher and scholar as well as an accomplished teacher. But one of his true loves is really innovation and entrepreneurship, commercialization of research and scholarship. Um, he spent quite a few years as Penn's senior vice provost for research, and in that role, he uh, has managed the Center for Technology Transfer at Penn, and he has been overseeing the uh, development of the new Penn Center for Innovation, which is sort of the next generation expansion of what has been the Center for Technology Transfer, but it's much more far-reaching and encompassing, and really is going to be a key to the university's future. Um, as a new dean coming into a school, he is engaging in his own process of 
crafting a strategic plan for the school to take us forward through his deanship, but really through the next decade. Um, and Steve being very much not a top-down kind of a person, he is really engaging in a year-long process of widely gathering input from many different stakeholders, from across groups of faculty, um, from alumni, from current <coughs> students, undergraduate, graduate, professional students, and also from the staff of the school, and with his colleagues in other schools of the university. Um, the timeline is that we're very uh, intensively um, doing that stakeholder input gathering, discussions, listening, trying to out what are the big important themes for the school going forward over the next um, eight to nine months. We'll begin actually drafting the plan in the spring and finalize it over the summer, and it will be published at the beginning of the next academic year. So he's really giving himself one full year, with the permission of the president and the provost, to put together uh, a meaningful and important plan for the school. And <clears throat> he's also making a real effort to connect threads that resonate for arts and sciences, but connect them to that Penn Compact 2020 and the president's vision for the university as a whole. Um, because we are arts and sciences, and I think as Alan was alluding to, one of the key themes in the plan will be affirming the importance, the value, and the relevance of the liberal arts and sciences. Um, and I think that's very important for all of our programs, and especially dynamics. There's quite a history in dynamics of engagement with many of the disciplines of arts and sciences. And our recent program review affirmed the importance and the fit for dynamics with arts and sciences, whether it's disciplines from the social sciences, like sociology, political science, anthropology, whether it is the humanities, cultural area, language studies, history, philosophy. There's all kinds of cross connections. And I think Dynamics is an amazing example of a truly interdisciplinary program. Um, not only interdisciplinary in the sense of connecting the foundational theoretical research of standing faculty with the application to practice that our practitioner faculty can provide and that is relevant for our students, but also merging these academic disciplines and, and reaching across school boundaries. In the arts and sciences plan, the themes of increasing access will be incredibly important, um, particularly transforming education at all levels. And when Steve Fluharty speaks about this publicly, he makes a point of saying he wants to transform education at the undergraduate, graduate, and professional and lifelong learning levels. So it, what we do is very much a part of his vision and part of what he wants to focus on. We'll also continue to focus on aspects of diversity among our students, our faculty, our staff, and as a, as a way of increasing access and improving the excellence of Penn and arts and sciences. Integrating knowledge, which we just spoke about a little bit, Steve's real emphasis here and what he loves and cares about, which I believe we also in Dynamics love and care about, is fostering innovation, creativity, and the entrepreneurial spirit. Also championing university citizenship. Um, prior to becoming dean, I think Steve has like three degrees from Penn, so he's a dyed-in-the-wool Penn person from his teenage years. Um, but he was a faculty member in the veterinary school, and then he worked in the provost's office for many years. So he believes in one university, and he really, his, his great hope for arts and sciences, which is really at the core of this great university, and without which there really wouldn't be a pen, is that we will reach out ever more to our sister schools, whether it is education, design, Wharton, law, and again, I think that's incredibly relevant and important for Dynamics, and Dynamics has a long history of setting an example in that way. And finally, engaging locally, nationally, and globally. Here, the emphasis is on social impact, what we can contribute to shaping national policy, to bringing the world to Penn and Penn to the world, or to paraphrase Amy Gutman, bringing the world to arts and sciences and arts and sciences to the world. In many ways, if you look across the faculty in arts and sciences and our departments, I mean, this is what we do. Our faculty are international, our students are international. What they study is global in focus um, and not purely local. So what I, wanted, what I hoped to do this morning was to stop talking and to listen. 
because as part of crafting the arts and sciences plan, uh, Dean Fluharty has asked me to really draft for him the part about transforming education, professional education, and lifelong learning. Um, and I don't think I know enough to know how to do that. I'm not prescient enough on my own to know all the important themes, opportunities, uh, and elements that we should bring into our vision for the next 10 years. I have some ideas, but I think it's really incredibly important for me and incredibly helpful to me to talk with our communities. And this is a, a, an amazing community made up of current students, alumni, faculty. Um, you're out there in the world, in so many parts of the world. I wanted to pick your brains a little bit this morning and have you help me think about what we should be including in the plan. How do we want to transform professional education in arts and sciences over the next decade? What should we be thinking about? What are themes? What are opportunities? I believe as you came into the auditorium, you were handed a card and a pencil. And so I'm going to ask if everyone can just take a, two minutes and write down one idea. If you have two, write down two, but at least one idea of something that you think should be considered in crafting this part of the arts and sciences strategic plan.